Good morning, Stocktonians, and welcome to another episode of Tales and Tips. This morning, I have with me Shifra Steele of Northern California Weimaraner Rescue, and we're trying something different today. We are back on the train of doing animal talks, and we're trying a remote guest. So we are having some audio challenges with that, so our program may be a little slower than typical, so please be patient with us, and we'll hopefully provide awesome information about an amazing rescue group for Weimariners. Shifra, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good morning, Julie. Awesome. Good morning, Shifra. Thank you so much for being with us today. So tell us about yourself and Northern California Weimariner Rescue. Well, Northern California Weimarana Rescue um, started as a very, very small group. And uh, really, Kathy Dunn is the grandmother of rescue in Northern California. She started rescuing Weimaraners about 35 years ago, singularly. And then uh, little by little was joined by a handful of rescuers. Um, she only rescued about one or two Weimaraners a year. And uh, we were up to about rescuing 150 Weimaraners a year several years ago. And then Northern California Weimarana Rescue became a 501c3 organization in 2004. Awesome. And do you span the entire Northern California area or do you interact also with other states? How does that work? Well, um, there's also a couple of groups in Southern California, Friends for Pets and Calware, which is relatively new. But we do work with them. We work with rescues in other states. Uh, Tickled Pink Weimaraner Rescue in New Mexico. Terry Pink is very, very active. I like that, Tickled Pink. Out. That's cute. We also go out of our boundaries and do rescue dogs from Southern California occasionally and even Oregon. Awesome. And can you back up a little bit and talk about how you became personally involved with this? I was given a Weimaraner when I was in high school, Shadow. I had a part-time job in high school, and I worked for a plumber who raised German short hair pointers. He acquired a Weimaraner to hunt rabbits, but the Weimaraner didn't want to hunt rabbits. He wanted to play with them. <laughs> so he gave them to me, and unfortunately, and he was huge out of standard, um, and unfortunately, I had to rehome him as well because my parents were afraid of him. So I found a very, very nice home for him, but he was an awesome dog, and I knew that was my dog for life. When I moved to California after high school, I tried to find a Weimaraner, and I couldn't find one. And so I bought a Vishla. After he died, I worked for a veterinarian, and I worked with um, a kid who was involved in showing dogs and raised feral hounds. He went to the Golden Gate Show and found a breeder, and that's how I got my first show dog, Remy, champion top hat store in gray, and that was in 1989. So, of course, Weimaraners were my dog for life. All right, and you mentioned earlier that your first Weimaraner was bigger than the standard. Can you talk about how big these dogs are and a little bit about their personality, what makes them unique? Sure. So uh, males and females differ quite a bit in size, or they can. So the standard for a Weimaraner bitch, as we say in the dog show world, is 23 to 25 inches at the withers, which is the shoulder. And in our standard, they're allowed to go an inch over or under and still be in standard. For the males, that is 25 to 27 inches with an inch allowed over and under. So in our standard, if you look at the smallest female, that would be 22 inches and the largest, 28 inches. And that's quite a big difference between male and female. Their personality is, they're just amazing. They want to do everything that you do. They want to be everywhere you are, even if it's the bathroom. No place is too small. They have no 
body awareness. They just want to be all over you and laying on your feet or on your shoulders or laying on your stomach. They're uh, very, very people-oriented, and they were bred that way by the Germans. The Germans wanted a dog that would hunt very closely with them, and actually they hunt very stealthily, and that's where the gray ghost uh, name comes from. And actually, that's also why most, well, not most, but a lot of wine runners are named Shadow, because that's (laughs) what they do. They shadow you. So the most important thing about having a wine runner, the most important thing to know is they hate to be alone. And when we place dogs, that is the first thing we look at is minimal alone time. We will not place a dog in a home where people both work full time. Sometimes that will work if they have a second dog, but not necessarily does a second dog mitigate them being without their people. So that is really the first thing that you have to know about a wine runner. Do not get a wine runner if you're going to crate them or be alone all day, because think about it, they're not going to read a book or watch TV. (laughs) They're going to get bored. They're going to get destructive and neurotic. And the way I like to spin it for people is if they're unhappy, your house is going to suffer. So you're going to lose things and nobody's going to be happy. Um, The second thing is that they need a lot of exercise twice a day, preferably, so in the morning, they need exercise. They need to just, you know, get their ya out. And then they need evening exercise. But they're not like some of the terrier breeds that are just go, go, go all the time. They have off buttons. Once they get their exercise in in the morning, they're pretty happy to just lay around. I live on acreage. I'm very lucky that we live that way. And I run my dogs in the morning. And then when I'm sitting around doing rescue all afternoon, they're pretty happy to just to just lay around and lay on your feet or whatever part of their body, you know, they can find. <laughs> and then about dusk, you can tell that they're getting a little restless and then it's time to let them run it out again. And for my babies that I've rescued through NorCal Weimariner, they're amazing. I, I think I've rescued six dogs through your organization at various times. And we're fortunate to also live on acreage. And I think that makes it so much more workable. And I actually find that for my male, he also has a middle of the day time where he needs to exercise. But otherwise, just like what you said, they're on the couch, they're on the ground by your feet. They want to be near you. And to me, as a breed, they are so beautiful. They're so majestic and regal. And the way that they run or walk just flows. They're just beautiful. Oh, they're amazing. I mean, when when I take my dogs out, that's just my favorite thing, just to watch them run, the grace and the power. They run out a million times a day through the dog door. If they hear something, you don't know what they're hearing, but all of a sudden they're out. But when I see them, we have jackrabbits and ground squirrels on our property, and they just take off. Mm-hmm. That, yes. that power and their noses just tell them where to go, and it's just, it's just amazing to watch. And because of their, their body structure and because they're, you know, the very, very short hair, you can see every muscle. And I think that's that's the beauty of the Weimar Honor. Yes, and they're very similar. You had mentioned the Vigla earlier, and I believe hereditarily those two breeds are connected, and to me they're, they're similar. Can you go back? You mentioned earlier some skills such as hunting that people will use Weimariners for. What are some other activities that people might use Weimariners for? Oh, they're good at everything. My uh, Mackenzie has about 19 titles in various areas. Um, agility, they're amazing at agility. They are amazing at nose work. I do barn hunt with uh, two of my four kids. Um, well, yes, yeah, the pheasant hunting, they, they love to do that. And actually, that, that is their element. I know a lot of people don't like to do that because of the involvement with the birds and yeah birds get hurt but that's it's kind of in their dna although in their heritage 
they were originally bred for uh, bear, boar, and deer. Oh, they I didn't were, know that. Uh, bigger dogs than in Germany, and then they they were downsized in this country to hunt upland birds. So in that process, they were downsized as well. So they're not as big as the, as they were when they were bred in Germany. But when I say that the hunting is in their DNA, I mean you take them out to the field and they hunt birds and you can just see that come alive. Yes, I've seen that with my own dogs who I don't hunt with. If they see a bird, especially my male, will point, which is amazing because it's not something that we've ever trained for at all. Right, it just, it just comes out. The other thing that comes out, which is really amazing to watch too, if you have multiple dogs, in the field there's something that's called honoring. And so the bird, the dog that is on point will be braced with another dog. So the dog coming up behind that sees that dog on point, some naturally, I don't, I don't even know how you would teach it. My dogs do it naturally, but they, they stand back. They are honoring the other dog's point. Wow. And that allows the other dog to do the retrieve and the other things that they need to do. But in my 15 month old puppy, I even, I see that. And I've seen that ever since, ever since we've been out in the field with her, she just will naturally, if the first dog is on point, her mother's on point or her grandfather's on point, she will just stand back. And then all of a sudden they know when to run and, and they go for it. And it's just, it's just amazing. Wow. So they have the pecking order established and that carries through to pointing and retrieving. I didn't realize that. Well, it is and it isn't because if she, it's just the first dog that's on point. They will honor the first dog that's on point. Okay. So that could be, that could be Meadow, the baby. Okay. If right. she's the first one that sees something, everybody else will honor that. Okay. And what about some health issues that are common to this breed? Well, probably one of the biggest ones is bloating, but that is also um, something that happens in all of the large uh, chested dogs. And so what happens, and they really, well, you know more about this than I do, Mm -hmm. but um, one of the theories is that some arrhythmia in their intestines um, makes them bloat up. Where, so the intestines aren't are having the food work through as well as it should. And so the stomach bloats. Well, you, you take this over, Julie. All right. You were doing a great job, though. You, you were giving a, a fabulous layman's explanation. So bloat for those well, of you... So when it does, when the stomach does fill up, then it, and then the dangerous thing is that it twists, and that's where the gastric torsion comes in. So there is some, you know, very uh, big signs to look out for, and the biggest one is discomfort. If you you know your dog and you see some weird behavior, you just you just know that that's a thing you go to the vet for. You do not wait. Right, Julie? Yes, you go as soon as possible. And and going back to the yes. bloat, they actually, where that term comes from is they look bloated. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the stomach yes. fills up with gas and or fluid. And just like Shifra mentioned, they can be at risk for the stomach twisting on itself, which is a life-threatening thing because the vessels and the tissue gets cut off from circulation and unfortunately they can die and during that time they're very painful, they're uncomfortable and the abdomen will get bigger and bigger, they'll start to have difficulty breathing and it's not something pleasant to see and I can't emphasize more what Shifra said about any time that you see any unusual behavior in your pets at all, you should contact the vet right away. It's it's never a bad thing to contact a veterinarian early, um, even if you're worried and something turns out to not be significant. That's a great thing. That's always better than waiting too late and having a, a result that we don't want. That's right. Uh, some of the other minor things that can happen, um, 
a juvenile dogs can often get hives. You know, they have this very short coat. So you go to the park and they roll around on the grass and all of a sudden they have hives. And it could be, you know, maybe the grass was treated. But um, typically that's about the growth period, about, I don't know, seven months to a year where that can happen because their immune systems aren't fully formed. Some of the other minor things, um, they can have um, eye, eyelashes, sometimes a full set, but sometimes just one or two, and one or two can just be you know, kind of plucked out. They're, they'd be hard to see, but if you didn't know what to look for and you just saw that your dog's eyes were tearing, that would be something that you want to visit your veterinarian for, and they would look with a very bright light and see if your dog has eyelashes. That's something that... Um, breeders try to breed out of the line and but what about they're they're a pretty healthy breed what about joint issues and cancer well you know cancer is pretty rampant among dogs and uh wine runners are are certainly um not immune to that Part of that is diet, environmental, but I don't think that they don't get more cancer than other dogs, but uh, pet dogs, show dogs, all have episodes of cancer. That's just, um, it just seems to be how things are going in this country. And any large breed dog is prone to joint issues as well, arthritis as they age. Um, I do think right. husbandry plays a big role in helping to prevent that, making sure that your dog is a lean weight and gets good exercise, good nutrition, yeah. and such. And, of course, hip dysplasia, like other uh, large breed dogs. That does happen in wine runners, not as much as in German Shepherds and some of the other breeds, but it does happen. For show dogs, we um, x-ray hip and elbows just to make sure that um, if that dog is going to be bred, that you're going to be, you're going to have good hips and elbows in that line. And earlier, you talked about some challenges with Weimariners and kind of the household. Can you also mention or talk about cats and small dogs and integrating those with Weimariners and concerns? Well, all of my dogs have grown up with cats, and uh, we actually have three cats, two Persians, and, I mean, they are amazing with the cats. The cats just sleep with them, and they know that they're family members. But the issue is when we have rescue dogs, we, we don't know their history. Most of the dogs that we get are strays from the shelter. So we have no idea of their history. The challenge is placing them because um, if somebody has a cat, we don't know if they're a cat killer. I will not place a wine runner in a home with a cat unless for some reason we can get a, a foster home that agrees to have their cat be a uh, guinea pig and wants to try it. But um, I won't place a dog in a home where there's a cat if I don't know the history of the dog, and like I said, most times we don't. Small dogs is the same, is, uh, same issue, and kids, same issue. We get these dogs with unknown histories, and I won't take a chance to say that they can be with small children, small dogs, or cats. But they can be integrated. Um, if it seems like it's a pretty gentle dog, not a lot of prey drive and some of these some of these evaluations are done you know at the shelter and then we also have our own evaluators that um, will go to a shelter and evaluate a dog but um, they can be integrated most people don't want to try that i've had dogs that um, i've integrated with cats and it just it takes some patience it can be done but like i said most of the time i don't push that issue unless I know and I'm, the dog I'm, has a good history with small small dogs and cats. I'm glad you mentioned about children too um, because it is a worry and, and no one including anyone from the rescue groups or anyone who's adopting wants to have a bad outcome. We want to make sure 
that when dogs are placed, that it's positive and it's a win-win for everyone. Yeah, I agree. I think that, that that's the prime directive here. And then what I tell people, we often get these people and they want, you know, they want a young girl, one to four, and, and maybe I have like a boy and he's six, but I know that he's good with children. And I say to people, well, your, your most important thing is to not have these parameters that you've set for yourself, but your, your, the big parameter should be, I want a dog that will, is good with my kids. Yes, and a good fit. So yes. I will often ask people to think out of the box that way because that should be the most important thing that they're thinking about, not that they want a petite female. <laughs> and talk about other breeds that you work with. So I, I know that I've seen on your rescue page that you might have mixes. Will you also foster completely different breeds, labs, or other, other types of dogs? You know, typically we, we do do the mixes, but really not the other breeds. Sometimes we'll have a courtesy listing. We've had uh, Doberman Weimaraner mixes, lab wine mixes, but aside from courtesy listings for other breeds, we, we really pretty much stick to Weimaraners. And what we say is if it looks like a Weimaraner, acts like a Weimaraner, then we're going to treat it like a Weimaraner. Awesome. In and terms of, you know, us being able to place and foster. And I know earlier you mentioned working with shelters. What about working with other rescue groups, Weimaraner or non Weimaraner? We've had private rescues that have contacted us that uh, they found a Weimaraner and, you know, want to surrender that Weimaraner to us. And that works out really, really well. We've had other shelters and we work with, with all kinds of organizations. And as shelters, private rescues and, yeah. As someone that, that is high up in, in the rescue group, the Northern California Weimaraner Rescue. Can you talk about some key things that will help people to not be in a situation where a dog needs to be rescued? Well, one of the biggest things that happened is, um, and especially a few years ago, we were getting a lot of dogs because people were having to uh, move into apartments, losing their jobs, that's the biggest reason why uh, dogs have to be rehomed is, and unfortunately, it, in those cases, it's not the people's fault. Then there's the lifestyle changes. Uh, you know, we got this Weimaraner and we got married and now we're having kids and people think that's a reason enough to give up their dog because they're having kids. It's sad. That's the second biggest reason that... Um, that we get dogs that need to be rehomed. And then there's the occasional, we had a dog, Alonza, uh, two years ago, whose owner was shot and killed. Wow. And none of the family members could take her, and um, so we got her and rehomed her, and she was, I think she was 12 at the time. Wow. So, and I think the thing to remember from that is, have a plan for your dog. Um, have a will. If, if you don't have it in your will that a family member is going to take the dog, have some kind of a plan that if something occurs to you, you die in a plane crash, your dog has somewhere to go. I agree. So Having not, a, a plan. All your other family members don't have to scramble and figure out what to do with this poor dog. And unfortunately, like, like I said, in this case, it was a senior dog. Senior dogs are very, very hard to place. Well, in your organization, at least to my recent knowledge, will actually give senior dogs if you find a good quality home for them. Is that still correct? We, we've, we are really lucky. We had somebody several years ago who adopted a 12 and a 14-year-old because the, uh, the 14-year-old, they were both girls, was becoming incontinent and the owner who had them since they were puppies, you can't even wrap your head around this, refused, she didn't want her in the house because she was leaking, even though, you know, there are medications for that. Yes. The, 
the angel that adopted these two lived in San Francisco and carried that dog up and down the stairs for two years until she died. Wow. That's amazing. So that person did for those two dogs what her owner wouldn't do. Wow. It still angers me when I think about that. That's amazing. Can you talk about blue Weimaraners? Well, yes. The blue Weimaraner was an anomaly in Germany, and the Germans didn't like them. They cropped up in this country, and a lot of people uh, are now breeding the blues. Blues are allowed to um, enter certain events, AKC events, but they cannot be shown in confirmation. All right. they, they are beautiful, and they make nice pets. Their, their color varies from kind of a pewter, and they can go all the way to black. And I have one, and Velvet, and she's amazing. And it to me, it just adds to her majesticness. Um, let's go yeah, back. It, they're a beautiful color. Let's go back and, and talk. And also long hair, Weimaraners that many people don't know about. And I haven't seen one of those. Tell us about those. They're the beautiful color. They're the color of the silver grays. I actually, that's kind of interesting. I've never seen a blue long hair. But they, their coat is similar to a golden. So the feathers, wow. and that's the fur on their, on their legs, is not as long as an Irish setter. It's kind of the length of a golden. Um, they do have a plume tail. They're very, very pretty. You don't see them a lot. In Australia and New Zealand, you would see more of them, but uh, you're not going to see them walking down the street in San Francisco very often. <laughs> they sound beautiful. Um, let's go back to the organization itself, Northern California Weimaraner and Rescue. Tell us, how does someone become involved and do you have a website, a Facebook page? How does someone contact you? We're very easy to find if you just Google Northern California, Weimaran Rescue, any of that combination will come up on the first page on Google. We do have a website, NorCalWeimRescue.org, as well as a Facebook page. We always need volunteers. We, we have a lot of people in our database but we, we always need more. Fosters are the biggest challenge. We, we just need fosters all of the time because that's the, what enables us to rescue these dogs because we, they don't do well in boarding. So if we can pull a dog from a shelter and put them in a foster home, that's really the ideal situation. The challenge about that is when these dogs come from the shelter, often they're exposed to kennel cough. So we can't put them in a foster home where the foster home has their own dogs for the exposure. So that's why we always need more and more foster homes. And currently, how many foster homes do you have? You know, they come and go. Uh, right now, really only a handful. There's a handful of people that we can always count on for, um, for foster so if we get more than a handful of dogs, you can see, then we're, then we're stuck. Sometimes we do have to take dogs from shelter and put them in boarding. Sometimes that's our only option. And you would do a home inspection for someone who's going to be a foster, similar to what you would do for someone that's wanting to adopt a Weimaraner. Exactly. We go through the same process. So our process would be that um, you go to our website and submit an application. Then uh, someone will call you and do a phone interview. At that point, if we're satisfied with the phone interview, then we will schedule a home visit. And after that, then I, as a placement coordinator, would call you and discuss available dogs. Okay, and those available dogs can be found on your website? Yes and no. Uh, sometimes they are, but our list of 
applicant is so long, and right now we're getting so few dogs that some dogs never make it to the website. Wow, that's a a good problem. That's coming in, and I have a home that I know is perfect. And so that's why we tell people, don't wait until you see that dog to put in an application. Put in the application now. Then you're in the queue. Then all I have to do is is look at my list and, and say, oh, Julie wants a dog. Well, this, <laughs> this dog just came up. Nobody will even know about her. But, you know, I'll call Julie and, and I'll make that match. Awesome. Awesome. And talk about some of your fundraising events. So our biggest event is the Wine Country Gala, which was started. This is our 14th year. Wow. And that gala will be October 8th in Petaluma at Flying Cloud Ranch. When That's a new started, location. We had just become 501c3 in 2004, and we wanted to put together a fundraiser. Michael, my husband, who is the president of NCWR, we had been to a fundraiser in St. Helena for a no-kill dog shelter, and it was a great event. And they had silent live auction, and there were many things that we, we liked about the event. What we thought was missing from the event was that there were no dogs there to look at. So we wanted to plan a similar event, but that's how we started the Parade of Rescue. We wanted to have rescue dogs there for people to hear their heartwarming stories. And so I, we, we actually have them do a little parade, and, and we tell a little bit about the dog, and then they get a medallion. It's, it's really great, and nobody leaves dry-eyed, so it, it's really fun. But the rest of the event, we have uh, music, and um, Kathy Dunn, who's the, actually what I mentioned before, the grandmother of the breed, she's still very involved in rescue, and she does the catering. It's a great event. And uh, I would love everybody to come out because it's much more centrally located now. And other events that we have, we have a calendar contest. This will be our second year. And we then produce a calendar from the, uh, from the photo contest winners. There is another event that's going to be, this will all be on our Facebook page, by the way. But we have another event uh, July 16th in San Jose. And that we are posting that on our Facebook page as well. And then we have a wine walk, which is not a fundraiser. It's just kind of a fun day. This is probably our sixth year doing that, where we go to the dog beach in Carmel, and 50 wine runners run around and go crazy and swim, and it's just an amazing thing to see. So I've participated in several of the events you just mentioned. The Parade of Rescue to me is one of the most heartwarming things that I've ever seen or been involved with. And you're definitely right with saying that there's not a dry eye and hearing the stories. And often you'll have the Rescuer of the Year and the Foster of the Year. And that's amazing, too, to hear their stories. And I love the Beach Day with the Weimariners. All of it is just amazing. Yeah, we've, we've had some amazing rescues. Um, our recent rescue was um, this poor dog. He, he was a puppy, only three months old. His name is Finn. And he was found as a stray. Four days later, the shelter found out that he was chipped. He also had uh, two broken back legs. Wow. And he'd been sitting there in the shelter with this oh, my God, the pictures of him screaming and, you know, just looking like he was in such pain. And uh, we had one of our fosters is very, very good at um, taking care of dogs with special needs. And she fostered him, and he's in a great home now and uh, doing nose work and playing ball and just being a puppy. And that's what it's all about. That's why we do this every day. Awesome. Awesome. And talk about your booth and the different events that Diane Venzen goes, goes to. She does amazing outreach. Oh, Diane's amazing. She's, she's got her own show going on. She goes out sometimes every weekend with her booth and is so active in educating people about Weimar honors. 
all the events that she does are can be on seen on our face our Facebook page and also on our website. If you go to NorCalWineRescue.org and then go to events, all of her events that are coming up are listed, as well as pictures of the last event and just the events that she does are are just great. She travels all over. Awesome. And she, she's so instrumental in, in educating people about wine runners. And some of that education might be wine runners are not for you. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Well, and that's important to realize because even though you and I could rave and rave about wine runners for hours, it's not the dog for everyone. It's a, a huge time and space and energy commitment. And there are potential concerns well yeah and a lot of people you know people get mad at us too for not placing a dog with them because they think hey i'm trying to do a good thing i'm you know i want to rescue a dog but if her situation isn't right for the dog then like i said before nobody's going to be happy but you know our our prime directive is we're trying to place a dog in in a great home and you might be like a great person but it doesn't mean you're a great home for a wine runner. Yes, yes. And I want to go back a little bit. We were talking about some of the reasons why animals might be rehomed. And I just want to touch on the issue of pet overpopulation because especially in Stockton and the surrounding area here and nationwide, pet overpopulation is a huge issue and to me, closely linked to that is spaying and neutering of your pet. Um, unfortunately, so many wonderful, wonderful animals are euthanized every year simply because there are not enough homes for them. Do you want to comment right. on that? Well, that's why, that's why we're here. We, we want to make sure that these wine runners that we rescue get spayed and neutered it's funny we've we've even had people come to us and say we want to rescue a wine runner but we want it to be intact so we can we can breed her yeah you can't even imagine the types of things that people ask us but yeah it that's really really important we um sometimes we do get puppies so we want to place them in homes obviously we can't you know neuter or or spay them that early so they'll have to go in a home or foster where we know that these people aren't going to turn around and and then breed them which is the reason why we're so busy doing what we do because people are indiscriminately breeding yes and and all the rescues and all the shelters are so busy and a lot of times people will be breeding just for the misconception that it's better for a female dog to have one litter, which is not true. The earlier that you spay her, the better protection from cancers and other issues. And they also feel that that's an excellent way for their family to experience the whole birthing process. But now with the internet and videos and such, there are so many other ways to show that and not have to put an animal in harm's risk. And when the birthing process itself can have complications as well, at the emergency clinic on a routine basis, I might have to do an emergency C-section because the mother is not able to pass the babies or babies are born dead. And it's just, there are a lot of issues. Well, those reasons you mentioned uh, are, like, so old school. I'm hoping people don't e- really even think that anymore. Nobody should be breeding unless they really, really know what to expect. It is, it is such a huge undertaking. And you hear these people say, oh, you know, I, I found this litter. You know, she, the mother went and had the litter under my deck. And it just, things like that just makes you cringe. There are so many things to know about breeding. And, and and matching dogs, if you're going to do it, not just like you have a wine runner, I have a wine runner, let's make wine runner puppies. You have no <laughs> idea what you're getting into. Are you breeding hip dysplasia? Are you breeding full dentition? I mean, the, the, the people that have these um, conceptions about why they're breeding, they're just, they need to be more educated. Yes, I think education is the key. 
and talking to your veterinarian. Your veterinarian can provide a wealth of information. Your veterinarian is there to help you. And I'm sure every veterinarian would agree that we want to prevent problems and ensure longevity for pets and happiness for people as long as possible. Well, we have something in, uh, in our wine runner ethics and th- which says that the only reason to breed a wine runner is to improve the breed. That means you have a stellar example of the breed to pass on the genes and make sure that wine runners stay wine runners. If, if you're not doing that, then, then don't breed. And I wish that, that everyone who wanted to breed a dog had that intention. Um, I still feel that people don't realize the number of animals in our area and beyond that are euthanized simply because there are not enough homes. And we're talking about healthy, wonderful, sweet, loving animals. Right. And if you think about it, when we were rescuing 150 wine runners in Northern California alone for a breed that most people haven't even heard of, that's really astounding if you think of the numbers. Yes, yes. And in our area, we are flooded with chihuahuas and pit bulls, and the shelter is full of them. They're sometimes roaming the streets, and it's just a big issue, and yet people continue to breed them. Well, and that's, it's so ridiculous. It just, uh, I don't even know if I want to go there, but, you know, thousands of pit bulls and chihuahuas are being euthanized every, every week. No, that's true. And people, I live in Lake County, and that's a huge problem up here. People breeding pit bulls just, you know, just churning them out, and, and they're being euthanized just as quickly. Let's go back and and touch on some good husbandry practices. Um, Talk to me about your feeling on microchips versus tattoo or both together. Oh, well, my first Weimaraner was tattooed and they didn't do it very well. So the tattoo kind of grew with him. So I w- and it was horrible the way he was tattooed because you had to hold him down and microchips have just uh, I didn't even know people were still tattooing. There are some but microchips are far superior. And I would agree with that. There are some dogs that are still being tattooed. I see it more in Europe, but in European or dogs that come from Europe, but it is still being done here sometimes as well on the inside of the ear or I've seen it on the inner thigh. Um, but I agree with you. Microchip, I feel, is far superior. And you can do a microchip so inexpensively in our area. I think it's as low as $5 from Lost and Found 209, which is a wonderful, wonderful asset in our community. And you hugely increase the chance that that animal will come back to you when you microchip. Right. Oh, it's, it's so important. Every dog that goes through our system gets microchipped. I think it's wonderful. And occasionally a microchip will migrate um, or be defective. But honestly, in 20 years of practicing, I've had very few issues with microchips. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a necessary part of rescue. We had a dog that we was an owner surrender and bred by uh, a less than stellar breeder. And we brought her in to get microchipped. And before that could happen, she got away from the fosters. And that was just panic time because the dog was super shy, very, very timid. And here she was. She was only about seven months old. She wasn't spayed yet. So we were just panicking. Now, here's this beautiful dog running around intact, not in season, but intact and not microchipped. We were just completely panicked. We did get her back. She's in a great home now, microchipped, but that was not a great weekend for the Weimaraner rescue coordinators. That's lucky that you got her back. Yeah. Well, the foster just, you know, just didn't give up. 
and got closer and closer to her, was tracking her. And, um, but yeah, it was panic time. Can you, you earlier, you touched on the AKC. Can you talk about what it's like to show in an AKC show and also tell us some of the different places that you've traveled to for AKC shows? Well, that's, you know, that's my first love as far as dog activities. That was what I was first involved with, with uh, Remy when I got him in 1989. And it's a a big passion of mine. I love showing dogs. I've been to, Michael and I went to Westminster twice with Remy. Wow. I'm going to Washington for a breeder's futurity, kind of like a breeder's sweepstakes, you could say, going to Washington for that. And usually we have probably two weekends a month that we go to dog shows. Most of our dog shows are are pretty local, um, Vallejo and Dixon and Napa. But, you know, we have gone out of state. There's a great show in uh, July 4th weekend in L.A. in Ventura, right across the street from the beach. Great venue. Lots of dog shopping. And what I love about dog shows, other than showing, is that is the shopping, of course, everything is for dogs, but <laughs> there's so many things that are for kids. You know, you go to a park and the park is for kids or, you know, the playground's for kids. You go to a dog show, it's all about the dog. It's all about the dog. You shop for the dog, you're showing the dog, you're, you know, sitting around with your friends, talking about dogs. It's just uh, dogs, 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 24-7. Awesome. And I love the Golden Gate show and... I'm sure from a, a perspective from someone who's showing, it's frustrating because it is a bench show, meaning that the person has to be there with their pet the whole time. But it's amazing to see the beautiful dogs and to just watch them compete. Yeah, it's a love-hate relationship with that show because, because you know, you go there and you, you uh, decorate your bench and, and that's fun. But about the second day, your dogs are looking at you like, why are we still here? (laughs) But it is fun. You know, it's fun to answer questions, and that's good shopping, too. But um, the dogs love it. We we usually, we don't have them in crates. We take them off the bench, and, you know, they're just kind of standing around with us getting admired. It's kind of like the Weimaraner photo booth. (laughs) People are just taking photos like all day with your dog so it's it's really fun but you know there's there's just nothing like showing your own dog and just being you know so proud of how your dog is behaving and how they look in the ring and it's just it's just a super fun thing to do with your dog all right and as we're winding up can you go ahead and give your website information again and the gala information and how people can get tickets Okay, so the, we have a Facebook page, Northern California Wine Runner Rescue. The website is norcalwinerescue.org. If you go to our website, you'll also see a page called Gala. Click on that, and um, you'll be directed to how to buy tickets through PayPal. They're actually not tickets. It's, it's a reservation. Once you buy the ticket, we put your name on the list. But I encourage people to come out. You can bring your dog. Leash dogs are welcome. We've had as many as probably 75 dogs at one time there. And they don't have to be Weimaraners. They can be other types of dogs, too. Yes, we've had Chihuahuas. We had a Bulldog, uh, Fischla. So other dogs are, we, we don't discriminate. Other dogs are welcome. And when is their behaved? When is the gala again, and how much is it to go, and where is it? The uh, if you make your reservation ahead of time, it's um, thirty five dollars. It's forty dollars if you're buying tickets the day of at the door. It's Flying Cloud Ranch in Petaluma, and it's twelve to four. A lot of fun, live music, hors d'oeuvres, wine tasting. What's the date? And a si- silent live auction. What's the date of the event? Oh, oct- I'm sorry. <laughs> it's October 8th. Awesome. Awesome. And is there anything more that you'd like to add? 
Well, yes, a plea for volunteers. We really, really, there's two areas that we are always uh, looking for volunteers. As I mentioned, the fosters, we really need fosters. If people think that they could foster, some of the sh uh, fosters are very short term. As I mentioned, I often have a home for the dog. We just need a place to park them for maybe a couple of days sometimes. We need uh, transporters. We're always in need of transporters, especially along uh, nine, going south and north on 99. All right. We always need people to do home visits. That's another really hard um, job that sometimes can muck up the work because we're trying to get somebody approved so that we can place a dog with them, but we can't find a volunteer some places are, you know, out of, out of the way, and we know we're not going to have a lot of volunteers, but the more volunteers we have, the, the speedier we can, um, a speedier process we can have in, in accepting applications. Awesome. And I'm sure financial contributions are always welcome. Do you still have items for sale through Cafe Press? We really, really don't. We just uh, haven't kept that up. So sorry about that. Maybe that's something we, we have to think about. But we will have our calendars available for sale awesome. at the end of the year. Awesome. Awesome. And I really want to thank you, Shifra, for all of the valuable information and all of the wonderful things that you do to help Weimariners and animals in our community. Thank you for, for this interview today. And I'm looking at my notes, and I'm like, oh, I could have talked for another hour. So maybe we can do it again sometime. <laughs> maybe we can do it again. And I just want to, in closing, before we wind up, I want to give a shout-out to All Creatures Emergency Clinic and also to remind everyone that The Voice of Stockton is your radio station. And please support us. We are still having our Tower Up fundraisers every other Thursday, now at Channel Brewing. And our radio station needs help so that we can represent you. I am the voice of Stockton. You are the voice of Stockton. Thank you. Have a great day.